Welcome to Shading Beyond the Basics. This course is designed for students who have some basic drawing skills and some basic shading skills. This course will introduce you to a series of shading tools and techniques that will add a whole new sense of dynamism and sophistication to your drawings. Now, if you're not yet comfortable choosing your drawing materials or lighting basic volumes, you might want to revisit the Shading Fundamentals course in the Art and Science of Drawing series. The Shading Fundamentals course will introduce you to some basic shading techniques as well as how to light simple volumes. So once you're ready, let's get started by looking at how light operates on some of the more complex secondary volumes. We're going to take a look at the cone and the egg. The cone is closely related to the cylinder. Just like the cylinder, if we run our finger along the length of the cone, our finger will move in a straight, flat line. But if we move our finger perpendicular to this direction, it would curve around the object and meet back up at the same place it started. When we encounter a volume that curves like this, there's a predictable pattern of light and shadow that we can expect. Because the right side of the cone is lit and the left side is in shadow, we can tell that the light source is coming from the upper right. Take a look at the edge of the cone that is closest to the light source. The lightest value we'll find on the cone is located here, along this straight edge that is closest to the light source. This brightest area on a curved form is called the center light. But you can see that as the cone curves around, the value gets progressively darker. As the cone curves away from the light source, it gets hit with light less directly, and therefore appears dimmer. The moment the surface of the cone curves completely away from the light source is called the line of termination. The line of termination marks the moment where the light ends and shadow begins. You can see that just like a cylinder, the line of termination on the cone appears straight. Even though the area directly above the line of termination appears darker than the center light region, it is still considered to be in the light. This dimmest region on the lit side of the line of termination is called the midtone. Next, let's focus our attention on the shadow side of the line of termination. You can see that the shadow side of the line of termination can be divided into two distinct sections. There is a darker band of shadow directly below the line of termination. It is called the core shadow. You can see that just like the cone itself, the core shadow is narrower at one end and wider at the other. Right underneath the core shadow, you'll notice that the value gets slightly lighter. This is called reflected light. Reflected light is created when light comes down from the light source, hits the surface the cone is sitting on, and reflects upward, subtly lighting the bottom of the cone. Finally, let's take a look at the cast shadow. You can see that the cast shadow mimics the shape of the cone itself. One edge of the cast shadow is straight and narrows to a point while the left edge of the cast shadow is curved, like the base of the cone itself. And once again in the cast shadow, we can see two distinct values. You can see that the darkest part of the cast shadow is directly underneath the cone. It is called the occlusion shadow. The occlusion shadow will usually be the darkest value. It is one of the few places in a drawing or painting that you can use actual black. You can see that the occlusion shadow is darker than the rest of the cast shadow as well as darker than the core shadow. You can see that as the cast shadow moves left and away from the cone itself, it begins to brighten. You can also see that the further the cast shadow gets from the cone itself, the edge begins to diffuse. Take a look at the cast shadow near the tip of the cone. You can see that the edge of the cast shadow here is much firmer. Now take a look at the edge of the cast shadow at the far left. The edge has softened considerably. This diffused edge of the cast shadow is called the penumbra. Now, I'd like you to take a moment, look at the cone, and make sure you can discern all of these individual values. Remember, it can be easier to see the shapes and edges of values if you let your eyes go softly out of focus or squint. Start by looking at the center light the brightest part of the cone. Next, move your eyes down and to the left and watch the cone get dimmer as it approaches the midtone. Continue to move your eyes in this direction until you come across the line of termination, the moment where the light ends and shadow begins. 
Remember, the line of termination marks one edge of the core shadow. You can see that on a cone, the core shadow edge at the line of termination gets firmer as the cone narrows toward the tip and softens as the cone gets wider toward the base. And finally, continue to move your eyes downward to the reflected light. Being able to recognize and understand the various light and shadow conditions found on a volume is the first and most important step to being able to draw them. Next, let's take a look at how the shadow conditions change on the cone when it is oriented upright. The lit side of the line of termination remains the same. We can see the center light gradually transition to the midtone. But on the shadow side of the line of termination, you'll notice that there isn't really a discernible core shadow. Remember, in order to get the darker band of the core shadow, there must be a nearby adjacent surface that reflects light back onto the cone. With nothing to the left of the cone, there is nothing to reflect light back onto it, and therefore, we see no core shadow. If you're new to the Art and Science of Drawing series, or if you'd just like an in-depth review of how light operates on the foundational volumes, as well as how to use a value scale to accurately render all of these values, please review the Shading Fundamentals course of the Art and Science of Drawing series. Next, let's take a look at our first hybrid volume, the egg. We can think of the egg, or the ovoid, as a hybrid volume because it contains elements of both the sphere and the cylinder. To understand what I mean, take a look at the larger end of the egg on the left. You can see that much of it is perfectly spherical. Let's superimpose a sphere over the larger left side of the egg. Now let's imagine that we cut that sphere in half. This is essentially the volume that makes up the larger end of the egg. Next, take a look at the smaller front end of the egg on the right. Hopefully you can see that it too is essentially spherical. So both ends of the egg are made up of a half sphere. These two half spheres are facing one another. The half sphere on the left is larger than the half sphere on the right. The two ends of the egg are connected by a volume that is somewhere between a cylinder and a cone. Hopefully you can see the obvious relationship that this volume has with a basic cylinder. The only difference is, it is tapering, with the ellipse on the right side slightly smaller than the ellipse on the left. But another way to think of this volume would be as a truncated cone, or a cone with its narrower section cut off. So the simplest way to conceive of an egg as a hybrid volume is to think of it as two half spheres, one larger than the other, facing one another, and connected in the middle by a cylindrical or conical volume. The only difference between our volumetric diagram of the egg and the real thing is that the sides of the actual egg are slightly more rounded. Being able to break down hybrid volumes into their more basic volumes is an essential skill that will help you observe, analyze, and draw the various light and shadow conditions you'll encounter on more complex subjects. Now let's take a look at the various light and shadow conditions of the egg. Hopefully you can see that the light is coming from the upper right, which means that the section of the egg that is closest to the light source will be the brightest, excluding of course the highlight, which we'll look at in just a moment. Remember, this brighter section at the edge of the egg that is closest to the light source is called the center light. As the surface of the egg begins to curve away from the light source, we can see it get dimmer. This dimmer value is the midtone. As the surface of the egg continues to curve away from the light source, we find the line of termination, the moment on the surface of the egg where direct light can no longer hit it. Everything on the upper right section of the egg above the line of termination is considered a lighting condition, even the midtone. Everything below the line of termination is considered a shadow condition, even the reflected light. Because the front right section of the egg is rounded and spherical, we can see a highlight. Remember, a highlight occurs at the exact moment that photons travel down from the light source and ricochet off of the object in the exact location that sends them directly back into your eyes. The highlight is literally a reflection of the light source and indicates how shiny the surface of the object is.
The more polished the surface, the brighter and sharper the highlight appears. You should also remember that the highlight is one of the few places in your drawing that should appear completely white. Now let's take a look at the core shadow. Hopefully you can see that the core shadow on the egg is rounded at both ends, but straightens out in the middle, just like the egg itself. This is where it pays off to be able to understand hybrid volumes in terms of the more basic volumes they're derived from. For example, take a look at the larger spherical end of the egg on the left. You can clearly see that the core shadow curves upward toward the left. Now let's take a look at the corresponding section on an actual sphere. Sure enough, we can find the exact same shadow pattern. A core shadow that curves upward toward the left side of the sphere and is wider at the edge of the sphere. Next, let's take a look at the cylindrical middle section of the egg. In this section, the core shadow seems to straighten out. This is, of course, exactly the kind of shadow pattern we would find on a cylinder. And finally, let's take a look at the spherical end of the egg on the right. Once again, on the spherical section of the volume, we can see the core shadow curving upward, this time toward the right. You can see that the shadow conditions on the right side of the egg are not quite as dark or obvious as the shadow conditions on the left of the egg. Now let's take a look at the corresponding section of an actual sphere. Remember to let your eyes go softly out of focus or to squint when you're trying to discern values on volumes. Hopefully you can see the subtle core shadow curving upward and to the right. This is the same shadow pattern we see at the front right of the egg. Understanding how to shade more complex objects will be much easier if you understand the basic volumes that they're made of. Next, let's take a look at how light and shadow conditions change when we place two or more volumes next to each other. Here, you can see a cone and an egg right next to one another. I'd like to draw your attention to the reflected light on the egg. The portion of reflected light on the upper left side of the egg almost appears to be glowing. The reason the reflected light here is so intense is because, in addition to the normal amount of reflected light this section of the egg would be getting if it were by itself, there is also light coming down from the light source, striking the right side of the cone, and reflecting onto the egg. You can also see that this strip of reflected light is straight and is going in the same direction as the edge of the cone. Whenever you have two or more volumes in close proximity to one another, you'll want to pay special attention to how they reflect light onto one another. Next, let's take a look at a cone next to a cube. We can clearly see that the light is coming from the upper right, which of course sends the cast shadow to the left. The cast shadow moves across the ground plane exactly as we would expect until it is intercepted by the vertical plane of the cube. You can clearly see that the cast shadow of the cone climbs upward on this flat vertical plane. Next, let's switch out the cube for an egg. Once again, we can see the cast shadow moving left across the ground plane. But as it is intercepted by the round form of the egg, instead of the edges continuing on straight, you can clearly see them curve over the surface of the egg. In a drawing, this will help reinforce the illusion of roundness of the egg. Now I'd like you to take a look at the bottom left of the cone. It is a bit brighter than it would normally appear if it were by itself. This is, of course, because light is coming down from the light source, striking the right side of the egg and reflecting onto the bottom left side of the cone. Now that you have an understanding of how light is operating on these volumes, let's put these concepts into practice. To start this drawing, I've got the basic shapes of the cone and the egg down on the page. I've also drawn in the line of termination, separating the lit side of each object from the shadow side. And finally, I've drawn in the shape of the cast shadows, including the cast shadow of the cone that is curving over the surface of the egg. Once these basic shapes are drawn in, and I'm confident that they are accurate, I'm ready to begin the shading process. I'll start by laying a light wash of value into the shadow side of the line of termination on each object. When shading complex volumes or multiple objects, 
I would highly recommend slowly building up the values on all of the objects at the same pace, as opposed to trying to shade and finish one object before moving on to another. Next, you'll see me darken the cast shadows of each object, although I'm holding back on the cast shadow of the cone across the egg. I'll address this shadow once I begin to differentiate the different shadow conditions on the forms themselves. It's important to note that although the occlusion shadow section of the cast shadows will eventually go all the way to black, I'm not yet pushing the shadows to be that dark. This allows me to make sure the light and shadow patterns I've drawn are actually working before I commit to using my darkest values, which are extremely difficult to lighten once they are drawn. Remember, it's much easier to darken a value than it is to lighten one. At this stage of your drawing, even without any true darks, it should be apparent to you whether or not your shadows are working. Any final changes to the shape or placement of the shadows or volumes should be done now before committing to using the darkest values. No amount of shading is going to fix a problem with the size, shape, placement, or proportion of any of your objects. Once you're confident in the accuracy of your drawing, you can begin darkening up the values. To do this, you'll first see me define and darken the core shadow on the egg. Next, you'll see me darken the occlusion shadow, pushing the pencil to its darkest limits. Next, I'll do the same thing on the cone, but instead of the cone having a clear core shadow, the reflected light from the egg only lightens the bottom of the shadow on the cone. So I'll darken the shadow at the top of the cone but allow it to get gradually lighter as it nears the bottom. Next, you'll see me darken the cast shadow of the cone, including the section of the cast shadow that's curving over the surface of the egg. Once the shadows are working, I'll begin adding the midtones on the lit side of the line of termination. Remember, the only area where we will leave the paper completely white will be in the highlight. Instead of simply drawing around the highlight, you'll see me lift it out using an eraser. At this point, all of the light and shadow conditions on the objects have been addressed, but this does not mean that the drawing is finished. Once the basic shadow shapes and values have been addressed, you can begin to add subtlety and detail. I would encourage you to pay particular attention to the edges between all of the light and shadow conditions, hardening or softening them as needed. If for any reason you need a refresher on basic values, shadow edges, or the basic shading process, please revisit the course Shading Fundamentals in the Art and Science of Drawing series. Let's speed up the process as I continue to refine the values, including adding value to the surface that the volumes are sitting on. The resulting drawing has a good amount of subtlety and detail, but the foundational values, the highlight, mid-tone, core shadow, reflected light, and cast shadow are all clearly defined. So for your project today, you're going to need some basic drawing materials, and that's whatever you're comfortable using. A simple pencil, a white piece of paper, and an eraser is just fine. You're also going to need a cone shape and an egg or an ovoid. If you can't get a hold of a wooden cone like the one I'm using, look for something in your environment that's cone shaped. Or you can make your own paper cone by first cutting out a circle of paper, removing a triangular section from that paper that goes to the center of the circle, and then pull the two cut edges together and tape them. You're also going to need a light source. A simple desk lamp will work just fine. Once you've got your drawing subjects, your drawing materials, and your light source, you're ready to begin today's project. I want you to do at least two different drawings of your egg and your cone placed together, but in each drawing, I'd like them to be arranged in a different way. In this series, I'm giving you the bare minimum amount of practice. If you really want to increase your rate of learning and skill development, I would recommend doubling, tripling, or even quadrupling the amount of practice you're doing. Once you've done today's project, I will see you back here for the second lesson when we're going to take a look at how light and shadow work on concave forms.